Hey everyone, I'm Jake from CVP, and welcome to our October 2022 edition of Quick Kit. Links to everything we mention will be down in the description below. Let's get into it. Mica have announced their latest adapter, and this is one that I am super excited for. It's their new EF to E drop-in filter adapter. This looks very similar to the previous RF mount version that they produced, which we actually covered in a previous video, and it performs excellently for its price. There really aren't many E-mount adapters out there on the market which allow you to use drop-in filters. And for the FX30 and 3, as well as the Alpha series cameras, this could be a seriously great option for people wanting to use EF lenses and rear filtration, especially ND for video users. If this uses the same drop-in filter style as their previous RF adapter, there'll be a large range of filters available, not only from Mica, but Canons will also work as well, and so will Breakthrough Photographies, who offer single strength ND options for those who don't want to use a variable ND. It looks to be similarly priced to the RF version, which means it will be around the £182 mark, which is very affordable. We should be getting one of these into test ASAP to see how it performs, so if you have any other questions, let us know in the comments below. Connected workflows have been becoming more and more widely adopted since 2020, and Frame.io announced that three cameras will be getting the ability via new firmware that will allow them to connect directly to Frame.io and upload your rushes in what looks to be a very easy manner. This includes both the Red Raptor and XL version and the Fuji X-H2S. It's awesome that these cameras are getting this update. I was especially surprised that the X-H2S is getting it, but it's awesome nonetheless for both filmmakers and photographers who want their files available fast via Frame.io's platform for fast turnaround cuts or edits. With the Raptors, it will also be possible, if your networking handle it that is, to upload 8K RAW R3D files, including a log file, a CDL, a Provis proxy, a WAV, and a custom LUT, all for a single take. I'm intrigued to see what other cameras will have this integration going forward, as this looks like it could be a great workflow for so many people. Sony released a range of new kit this month, and let's start off taking a look at the three new cameras that they released, the FX30, A7R5, and ZV-1F. We've released videos looking at the FX30 and the A7R5, so if you want more detail, you can check those out. But here's a quick rundown of each camera. The FX30 is essentially an FX3, but instead of a full frame sensor, it has a 6K Super 35 sensor, a few features removed and a few added, and a lower price tag. This will make it a very popular video camera at its price point, as it offers a really great blend of video specs. The A7R5 is Sony's latest update to their high resolution alpha camera. And while it's definitely more aimed at photographers, it does have some pretty respectable video features, as well as some other general improvements I'm excited to see come to other Sony Alpha and FX cameras. The ZV-1F is a point and shoot camera designed for content creators and vloggers. It features a fixed 7.6mm or 20mm full frame equivalent lens, the ability to capture 4K30 and Full HD 120p, great connectivity options, and an affordable price tag. With such a range of Sony's cameras now using CF Express Type A, Sony have released two new Type A cards, a 320GB and a 640GB variant. Having the option for these larger ones is good, as Sony only had 80 and 160GB variants beforehand. They also released version 1.06 of their camera remote SDK, which is available to download via their site. Fujinon have announced a new broadcast box zoom lens, which is a little bit different their HZK 25 to 1000 mm f2.8 to 5. What makes this thing really interesting is that it's a box lens that has a PL mount and can cover Super 35 sensors as well as full frame. Most of these box style lenses cover small sensor sizes and use the standard broadcast lens mount B4. This lens also has a built in 1.5 times extender which allows it to cover full frame sensors but will result in a loss of light and change in focal length. So this lens is squarely aimed at high-end productions where they may want to use a camera like Sony Venice, a Mira or Alexa, but want the same operability you would expect from a box lens. The thing looks massive, but that's not surprising if we compare it to other box lenses and large range cine zooms such as the CN20. I would have loved to have seen this in a more cine broadcast housing, but the fact that the lens has such a fast f-stop range of 2.8 at the wide and f5 at the telly makes it incredibly impressive, especially compared to the CN20 for example. It also has optical image stabilization which again is a really unique feature for this style of lens. This will be very expensive, but 
it should become a staple for broadcast productions wanting to use larger formats where they may have normally used a smaller one with a box lens. I really do want to check this lens out as soon as I can in person. We managed to check out the DZO Film Vespid Retro lenses at IBC, but earlier this month, DZO released more information about them and opened them up for pre-order. The Retro series are available only as a 7 lens set, which consists of 16, 25, 35, 50, 75, 100 and 125 mm focal lengths. And the set will cost roughly around £21,000. The silver housing is the most obvious initial difference when looking at the lenses, but it's not just cosmetic, as they are made from a lighter weight aluminium, which results in them being much lighter than the regular Vespid set. However, the most important difference is the coatings they've used, which are way more gold and warm than on the regular lenses, which gives their flares a much warmer tone, as well as the image as a whole. We should be getting them to check out at some point, so let us know if you want to see some test footage down below. Lauer have released three new lenses, a new 58mm f2.8 APO lens from mirrorless cameras, and then two more cine-focused macro primes, a 65mm and 100mm T2.9, two times macro APO. The 65mm has been designed to cover Super 35 sensors, whereas the 100mm will cover full frame. The 65mm is limited to mirrorless mounts, whereas the 100mm is available in PL, as well as EF, RF, L and E mount. They are both 2 to 1 macro lenses, have a maximum aperture of T2.9, feature both manual focus and iris gears, and a 77mm thread for filters. These could be some solid options, as Lauer's macros in the past have been fantastic, and while there are plenty of 100mm macro options on the market now, I do really hope that Lauer keeps adding to their macro cine options, as I would love to see more focal lengths from them. Red release firmware 1.3.4 for the V Raptor which brings a range of new changes and features. The list is pretty long, but there are definitely some standout updates here. They've added a new ELQ compression option, which is below LQ. It updates the autofocus performance, and we actually saw face tracking in a beta version of firmware, which I'm really excited to see, but it's not in this release just yet. It also adds the Red Connect beta, which allows for full res R3D streaming via ethernet, but an extra license is required for this. They've also added a quiet record fan mode, a low voltage warning control function, and support for a range of CF Express Type B cards that weren't possible to use before. RED has also released the RED Control Pro app for controlling their DSMT3 cameras. The RED Control app has been available for a while and is free of charge, but this one is aimed at being a good solution for the higher end of the market with its features and its $500 price tag. It will work on iPad OS 14 or higher, as well as Mac OS Big Sur and above. You have a massive range of UI customization, and this version has actually been designed for larger screens, whereas the free version is more tailored towards phones. The app allows you to control multiple cameras at the same time, which is awesome. It allows you to do things like record on multiple cameras at the same time, push out presets to multiple cameras, and set color and white balance across multiple cameras simultaneously. It looks like a really, really powerful tool. Both DJI and GoPro have released new action cameras this month. GoPro brought out three versions of the Hero 11, and DJI brought out the Osmo Action 3. The Hero 11 features a new 1.9 inch sensor that can capture 10 bit up to 5.3K at 60 frames per second and 4K up to 120 frames per second. It also allows for the capture of 8 by 7 aspect ratio footage, which could be helpful for reframing and cropping after capturing your footage. It also has HyperSmooth 5, HyperView, which delivers the widest field of view in 16x9 of any Hero camera three new night effect time-lapse modes, a new battery, as well as other general improvements. The DJI Osmo Action 3 features a 1.7 inch sensor capable of capturing 4K up to 120p, and Full HD up to 240p. It can capture a super wide 155 degree angle of view, it has better heat management, DJI's D Cine-like picture profile, Rockstead 3.0 even in 4K 120, and improved battery life over its predecessor. The Adventure Combo comes with a cool looking case as well that can store and charge three batteries at the same time. It also has a front and rear touchscreen for controlling the camera. Both of these cameras look like good improvements over their predecessors, but let us know in the comments whether you still use an action camera on your shoots. Tilter announced a load of new products this month. First off was their ecosystem of accessories with the DJI transmission system, such as different handles, battery plates and rigging. They also teased that a version 2 is coming of their very popular Nucleus Nano wireless lens control system, but there really aren't that many details about it yet, but it should be an improvement and more affordable. 
they also released a mini articulating arm as well as their cage ecosystem for the X-H2 and X-H2S. Lastly, they announced a CF Express Type A to M.2 SSD storage handle for Sony cameras. While this solution could be a neat attachment for those not wanting to invest into Type A cards, I would always recommend recording internally with approved cards when possible, but this could offer a slightly better bang for buck than Type A cards currently. Right, let's get into our quick fire honorable mentions. Links to details about these are in the description below. Axoon released the Simu, a HDMI adapter that turns your phone into a monitor. Adobe released Premiere Pro version 23. Atomos released Atom OS 10.83. Apple released a new iPad Pro, which now features an M2 processor. Aperture released some new accessories for the Cobb 60. Blackmagic dropped the price of the A10 Mini Pro and released an update for the video assist to capture B-RAW from the Fujifilm X-H2S and Zcam E2 cameras. And DaVinci Resolve was also released for iPad. Canon released their latest firmware for the C300 Mark III and C500 Mark II. Came TV released a new gimbal support vest. Digital Glue released a new red approved B4 to RF adapter. DJI released the Mavic 3 Enterprise and Osmo Mobile 6. XSend announced their essential 2TB CF Express Type B card. GDU released a series of rehoused armored Canon RF lenses and released their Quantum Rig for the Komodo. Leica has released an updated version of the Summerlux M 35mm f1.4. Mica have added the 25mm T2.2 to their APS-C line of Mini Cine Prime lenses. Mofad released their new Poco drop-in filter PO adapter for E, RF, Z and L mount. Nanlite launched their FS60B, an affordable compact bicolor LED fixture. Nissi announced the Swift VND system. Octomass released components for the Raptor XL for their cage ecosystem. Panasonic announced a new 4K PL mount studio camera the AK PLV1000GJ, their latest PTZ camera, the UE160, and firmware 2.2 for the GH6, which adds USB-C SSD recording. Portkeys announced the PT6, a 5.2 inch 600 nit Full HD monitor. Rotolite announced the Neo3 and AOS2 Pro versions. SanDisk announced the Pro G40 external SSD. Sabrent released a new one terabyte V60 UHS2 SD card. Small Rig released their new Magic Fizz follow focus system. Shape released their new Ari Dovetail shoulder mount system. Steadicam has released the SteadyMate RS hybrid stabilizer for the Ronin RS. Tiffin announced a ND filter kit for the DJI Avata drone. Westcott announced the LS60B 60 watt bicolor LED fixture. Wise have announced two new CF Express Type B readers. Wooden Camera have released their ecosystem of accessories for the Fuji X-H2 and 2S. And last but not least, Zcam released firmware 1.0.0 for the E2 series of cameras, which allows them to output B-RAW via the HDMIs. If you enjoyed the video, please make sure you subscribe ready for next month's quick kit. And let us know what your favorite bit of kit to come out this month is in the comments below. And thank you so much for watching.